So, hi, and first of all, I'd like really to thank uh, Andre and all the other organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here and uh, to visit for the first time this uh, uh, nice place. So, first of all, let me just acknowledge my co-workers, in particular Sergio Caprara and Carlo Di Castro and Gert Seibold, with whom I've been working since many years now. And I think it is also fair for me to, to mention Claudio Castellani, who now retired, but with whom I collaborated for decades. And uh, a lot of the work we are now doing rests on work we did uh, along the decades. And uh, I also would like to acknowledge the collaboration with uh, our experimental friends, who, namely Giacomo Ghiringhelli, Lucio Braikovic, and uh, Ying Ying Peng and Riccardo Arpaia and Floriana Lombardi, who did some uh, resonant inelastic X-ray experiment, which are very helpful for us. So I don't think I need here to explain what a strange metal is. And just uh, I would like to make a, a very quick remark concerning the fact that, how this works? Yeah. Okay, that uh, uh, sometimes, quite often, strange metal behavior is associated to quantum critical points. But as a matter of fact, the known apparent quantum critical points which are associated to this behavior not exactly occur uh, below the non-fermi liquid strange metal phase. So sometimes there is some displacement and also sometimes uh, this uh, non-fermi liquid behavior, the strange metal behavior occurs over extended parameter regions. So you will see later why I'm mentioning this and making these two remarks. Uh, sorry. So one possibility to get strange metal behavior, this is of course is not the only possibility, but two sufficient conditions to realize a strange metal behavior are given by these two conditions. First of all, you can have some low energy scattering mechanism, and if the scattering mechanism is at low enough energy, you can get this linear in T resistivity, for instance, down to very low T. And if the temperature is larger than the characteristic energy of the mediator of the scattering, then the statistical weight, the Bose factor, just become proportional to T, and then you easily get that the scattering is proportional to T. So these classical fluctuations are immediately giving you a linear in T resistivity. Okay? Naturally, of course, you can notice that since in the Bose function there is T appearing and not the magnetic field, of course, you don't expect to have H over T scaling or the scattering not necessarily Splankian because there is some uh, coupling constant between the scatterer and the fermions which plays some definite role. So this is an open issue there. Another important ingredient to realize a strange metal though is that you need some isotropy scattering in order to affect the wall Fermi surface. Okay? Because if the scattering is peaked around some specific Q, finite Q, then uh, the scattering only acts on parts of the Fermi surface, the well-known hot spots, whereas the rest of the Fermi surface stays cold and it keeps its uh, Fermi liquid, the, the quasi-particles there have their Fermi liquid uh, behavior and everything stays Fermi liquid-like. Yeah? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, the point is that uh, it's not sufficient. I don't agree with point one. It's not sufficient to have a low energy scattering mechanism because that mechanism, you need a momentum sink also. The, the, uh, the what, what I'm saying is that uh, this is typically what happens with phonons at high temperature, well, but, uh, so, okay, above the block green ion. So, so this is a sufficient condition for so that. So you're neglecting drag. So you have to and say there is no drag. You're neglecting drag effects. Yes. Okay. So. Reiterate the previous point, but I didn't want to do it because I didn't. I wanted somebody else to interrupt first. So, I mean, it's the same point that I also am worried that you are saying if the resistivity is linear in T, it's not a Fermi liquid. That may be correct, but that has some assumptions built into it. That it's an inelastic scattering process or something. Suppose I have phonons and sure. the KF is very very small, then linearity in in resistivity, you can just standard equipartition will continue for very low temperature and that will not be so so what I'm saying what you're saying is not incorrect but you have some model in mind sure okay. I agree with you 
Okay, so this, keep in mind that these are not the only possibilities, okay? Okay, okay. But this, if you realize this, then you can have some strange metal behavior. Now the question is, do we have these two conditions realized, in, for instance, in cuprates? Well, some hint is coming from this uh, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering experiments, because in doing these experiments, our uh, experimental friends found that uh, the response in Rick's experiments it has a composite nature in this uh, underdoped region. In particular, you not only have this bluish peak in the density-density response function, which is due to the standard charge density wave fluctuations which occur at low temperature and low doping, but you also have a broad pinkish peak which carries a lot of weight. So there are abundant fluctuations, which we nicknamed charge density fluctuations just to distinguish them from the narrow charge density wave ones, although they occur at similar QC. So you can expect that these are not strange animals, but they are just very short ranged charge density waves, okay? And notice that they are ubiquitous in the sense that they survive at very high temperature and very high doping. So they are really everywhere in the phase diagram of cuprates, okay? And they have been confirmed many times in many different materials, okay? Now, just to keep things as simple as possible, imagine that these charge fluctuations have a very simple propagator. So which is the standard textbook propagator that you find in uh, just in near Gaussian z equal to quantum critical point. So you take this expression, which has a, an energy scale, which is the mass of this fluctuation, which is obviously related to the correlation length, psi minus two. Is, they have a quadratic dispersion around QC. There is some energy scale, which is an ultraviolet cutoff, which tells you where in energy, at high energy, these fluctuations tend to die. And there is, of course, the Landau damping here. Now, from experiment, it turns out that charge density fluctuations have a rather large correlation length, and therefore they have a rather narrow, low energy of order one, three millivolts, whereas the charge density fluctuations have a slightly larger energy because they have a much shorter correlation length. And the correlation length for this fluctuation is really small. So this charge fluctuation only makes one or two oscillations before they die out, okay? And the interesting point is that this fluctuation can be characterized very well from experiments. So you can determine their mass, you can determine their ultraviolet scale, you can determine, the, of course, their QC, okay? So there were good hints and good information coming from these uh, experiments, okay? Now the idea came immediately to look whether or not this uh, fluctuation, this short range charge density fluctuation, could be responsible for the strange metal behavior. So there is this whole red region here where you have charge density fluctuations, which are short range, and no charge density wave fluctuation, which are in this blue region here and are long ranged. And if you look at the momentum dependence, you see indeed that the charge density wave scattering is too peaked around the critical QC so that the luminar rise argument that they are short circuited uh, works and they don't work to produce tangent metal. Whereas this broad peak charge density fluctuation, they do because these are so broad in momentum that any place, any quasi-particle in the Fermi surface can be scattered anywhere. So the scattering is pretty isotropic and fulfills the request number two. We did this first order, very simple calculation. We just adjusted the fermion boson coupling and luckily enough, we succeeded in getting this uh, self energies which match pretty well the standard ARPES results. So this they show the, some marginal Fermi liquid like behavior because they are quadratic, constant, and then linear. Then they display some partial scaling here, okay? And uh, by adjusting the fermion boson coupling, you can fit nicely not only the linear part, but even the quadratic uh, contribution, which tend to round the Fermi liquid reproduces well experiments for this sample, which was an aluminum um, barium copper oxide sample, one, two, three sample, above optimum doping. 
Okay. Uh, both with the Kubo formulas and uh, with Boltzmann equations, so the two things. Using this. Uh, uh, so I presume you didn't include the drag effect. Right? Like, we use this. Uh, the yeah, is corrections in the Kubo formula. They, they are in, in the Bose uh, in the um, Kubo formula, for instance. We didn't put vertex correction because this is essentially uh, momentum independent. You can check that on the Fermi surface, we didn't put the momentum dependence here because these curves are essentially the same everywhere on the Fermi surface. The peak is so broad that you don't so you don't have vertex corrections in the response. The question is. Look at this uh, number. This is about uh, 8 millev. So this is the right scale for this sample, but this is the typical energy of this fluctuation. And therefore, you wonder, if this is the energy of this fluctuation, then how can it be that if I put a magnetic field and I extend the linear resistivity down to very low temperature, I can have linear resistivity using a fluctuation which has such a large energy. I violate this uh, condition number one about the classical character of the fluctuation, okay? So we should explain this. And fortunately, it comes uh, to our mind that there is this uh, Landau damping parameter. And if you plot the imaginary part of this uh, propagator for these fluctuations, you see that if you increase gamma, this is just the imaginary part of this, this is just this function, you see that for gamma which grows, the peak in the spectral density of this fluctuation moves towards lower and lower energies. And if you put also the Bose function, the true Bose function, okay, you get a lot of scattering at low frequency there. So this means that if you have, uh, for some reason, uh, a large gamma, you can extend the linear resistivity behavior down to lower and lower temperatures because this energy scale, the energy scale at which you really have this peak, uh, becomes smaller and smaller because it is not m, but it is actually m over gamma, okay? As simple as that. So the main take home message here for this very simple uh, theory, which is only based on the phenomenological uh, observation, the experimental, I would say, observation of this uh, charge density fluctuation, is that the dissipation parameter, the Landau dissipation parameter gamma, can rule the decrease of this quantity, m over gamma, and keep psi, so the correlation length, finite. So please, th this is something which I myself have sometimes hard time in remembering. We, we grow up with critical phenomena, knowing that to have small energy, you need larger and larger uh, fluctuations. This is not the case. So we don't have a critical slowing down with psi going to infinity. So the mass of this fluctuation stays finite. The only problem, the only point is that this fluctuation becomes uh, embedded in a more viscous uh, environment. Uh, more and more, okay? So you can have an isotropy scattering because psi is small, that is m is large, provided gamma grows large. So if we assume that for some reason gamma grows logarithmically, then the Fermi liquid scale on m over gamma shrinks, okay? Therefore, a general consequence is that you get a Fermi liquid, okay, at zero temperature, no doubt about that below the m over gamma scale, the system is a Fermi liquid, okay? But the range over which the system is a Fermi liquid shrinks when gamma grows larger and larger. So this is why we need name this a shrinking Fermi liquid. And this is just how the self-energy, the imaginary part of the self-energy looks like in comparison with the standard marginal Fermi liquid form. This is just a smoothened form of the standard max of omega t uh, marginal Fermi liquid. So you have the dashed lines which are the marginal Fermi liquid, and this is just the self-energy in a simplified form, because the real expression you can calculate is pretty long and tedious, but this is uh, the way you can mimic it over some uh, frequency range, okay? And you see that this is uh, a quadratic in frequency and temperature 
uh, for small omega and t because you span the square root. But if m over gamma tends to vanish, become gamma grows for some reasons, then you recover some marginal thermoelectric behavior. And this is why these dashed lines and the solid lines are, look so similar with respect to the case where m uh, gamma doesn't grow, doesn't. So in this case, you have different behavior, of course. And the point, however, that I'd like to draw your attention to is that Z is a constant at zero temperature. So you have a growing uh, mass for the quasi-particles, but they stay finite down to T equals zero. So the M star is finite, whereas the margin of free liquid has a log diverging. Mark, I interrupt you for one second. To what extent uh, this linear in T term that they had in imaginary sigma, suppose that T is much larger than omega, uh, is due to thermal fluctuations? Yes. It is. It is. Then how uh, gamma, which is a property of dynamics, can affect thermal fluctuations? Uh, suppose I take omega equal to zero. Okay. Why temperature is related to one over gamma? This is simply uh, the fact that you have a mass. The, the, the imaginary part of sigma is related to the energy the, where the, the imaginary part, the, there is the peak of the imaginary but, part. Can, can you, but thermal normally come from omega equal to zero. So Landau dumping is irrelevant for thermal fluctuations. Well, you still have a function. Okay, well, the, the, the original expression is quite complicated, but uh, this is the way you can fit it, okay? So, so this is the region where you recover the Fermi liquid, but you see it is narrower and narrower. And now let's look at some experimental consequences for that. For instance, okay, so you have the standard diagrams for the optical conductivity. You can neglect the vertex correction because the self-energy doesn't depend on momentum. Uh, you have some kind of Allen approximation which is valid because these two diagrams, which are important to conserve current and to satisfy world identities, have uh, rather strong energy dependence and they die at small frequency of order 40, 50 millev. Then you find that the optical conductivity, which comes from our self-energy, is essentially similar to the one that you obtain from the marginal Fermi liquid case. Because the, the self-energy has, for most of the, the, of the dynamical range, uh, in that form. And uh, notice also that you, have, of course, have some violation of scaling on scales like this, m over gamma, but which at high temperature is of order 10 milliliters. So you have also in the experiment this violation. But the problem is that you have also these uh, optical mass experimental results in the paper with Dirk and Michonne that is logarithmic. So this worried us because, of course, uh, they uh, show that there is this logarithmic marginal Fermi liquid dependence, whereas in our model, the M star is, uh, is a finite quantity, so it doesn't diverge logarithmically. And the question, the point, however, is that the slope, as far as I understand from the paper, is not uh, mandatory. It is not something which comes from experiment. It is fixed by assuming a given value for the spectral uh, intensity, so the total spectral weight, which is a reasonable choice, but it is not uh, mandatory in the sense that you can have some different slopes. And also the temperature range over this growth occurs for the optical mass uh, is much larger. It comes from two, uh, 300 Kelvin, whereas the specific heat loses its uh, logarithmic correction at 10, above 10 Kelvin. So our proposal is that these two things come from different sources. This comes from, indeed, from the electronic degrees of freedom which are addressed by this marginal Fermi-liquid-like, shrinked Fermi-liquid-like self-energy. And since, therefore, we have the same behavior. Whereas this comes from a different source which is due to bosonic modes which do have to be present in the thermodynamics of our system. And the fact that these two different origins 
could produce the same slope is actually maybe uh, simply the result of a choice that uh, our experimental friends made. Now, concerning the log t diversion of specific heat, uh, you can assume that uh, this gamma, okay, so we assume that this specific heat has a singular uh, behavior because of gamma, okay, and fitting the gamma function with the experimental uh, specific heat, we succeed in reproducing also the right energy scale for the resistivity where it loses linearity, okay? So this is the specific heat coming from the bosons, and this is the prefactor gamma which diverges logarithmically, whereas usually one is tending to think that this is the logarithm which has a linear in T mass which produces the log T behavior as in the standard Hertz and Millis theory. But in this case, M stays finite, so this is the logarithm which is just a number and it is this gamma which produces this logarithmic behavior. The same thing occurs if you look at the charge density F drag which is responsible for the Seebeck coefficient because from this diagram, this is the purely fermionic part, and the bosonic uh, phonon drag-like with the charge density fluctuation drag uh, term produces something which is also uh, proportional to gamma and therefore also has a cell logarithmic behavior which is also uh, reproduced in experiments. It's also visible in experiments. So this is the bosonic term which gives you this. Why gamma should grow large? Uh, this is just, let me just flash one possible model for that, which is only valid in 2D. And I would be glad to discuss why 2D could be so important. And the idea is simply that when you have a charge density fluctuation, this decays in the particle all pair. This is the Landau mechanism. And if this energies for these particles is larger than one over two, the elastic scatter in time, they have a ballistic character. If this is smaller, T and omega are smaller than one over two, then they decay in particle or pairs which start to diffuse with a repeated scattering over impurities. So this acquires a diffusive pole, and a diffusive pole, once you integrate over all momenta, because these are nearly local fluctuations, you integrate over all Qs, give you a correction in the imaginary part in the self-energy for the charge density fluctuation, an imaginary part which is logarithmically divergent. So these are my conclusion. And my conclusion are that if you simply take from experiments the charge density fluctuation, you characterize from Rick's experiment, you introduce them in the perturbative first order diagram to see how they uh, produce resistivity in the samples, you, you fit with only one parameter, which gives you moderate weak coupling. So you don't need to, wonder about, to worry about uh, uh, higher order corrections. If the dissipation parameter grows large, then you can also extend the linear resistivity regime down to very low um, uh, temperatures. And this behavior, log one over T uh, behavior for gamma, can be responsible for the specific heat and the Seebeck coefficient because of the bosonic contribution, as our chairman also showed uh, in a recent papers that uh, Fermi, uh, the free energy has to have both fermionic and bosonic contribution. Now the question is why there should be such a slowing down for short range fluctuation? Why this fluctuation should feel this uh, uh, viscous behavior, okay? Uh, so the idea is that T equals zero gamma diverges, so you should end up into a glassy phase. And in this sense then I agree with uh, Subir that some disorder should play uh, some role here to end up this. Uh, there could be also uh, some other mechanism which are reminiscent. Uh, I saw here uh, Jörg Schmalian. Uh, there was uh, a proposal long ago, but maybe we can discuss this later. So. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I see. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I missed a crucial point, which Shubir was asking in the beginning. To get transport, you need momentum relaxation. You are talking about charge density fluctuations that are arising from electron-electron interaction itself. So is it, you have umclap built into the process because Q is infinite yeah. everywhere, so you're assuming umclap everywhere. Because I notice you're calculating imaginary part of self-energy. So is there an assumption yeah. of umclap? Let me say something. Okay. Um, 
this uh, uh, form that I used for the propagator, for the chart density fluctuation propagator, has this omega square uh, over omega bar term. This apparently innocent term is very important because comes can come from purely electronic terms, uh, and then it gives rise to uh, a something which is momentum conserving, and therefore you get a sigma of omega, which is just a delta like. Okay? But uh, this can also come because this charge density fluctuation have a strong phononic component. So it's a built-in phononic component, and this is hidden in this uh, omega square of uh, omega bar parameters, which is important to give you uh, dissipation in your system. Okay, so the way the system you has some dissipation mechanism in it. So, but I mean, so momentum relaxation is coming from phonons. My question is purely physical. Yeah. What, where is the momentum relaxation coming from in your theory? Never mind the propagator. What, what is the process that's causing the momentum relaxation? Without momentum relaxation, there is no transport, right? If momentum is conserved. So what's causing the momentum relaxation in your theory? Scattering by a large momentum. Yeah, yeah I um, think it's umclops. Umclap built in, as I said, in your theory. Not only umclap. I mean, yeah. everything yeah. in the Fermi yeah. surface yeah. is everywhere. Without it, umclap, you will not get any. Yeah. Yeah. May I try to rephrase all the questions, maybe not, because there are discussions going on in the last week. So I think that what should be touched from the point that you can have an imaginary part of the quasi particle self energy, which is anomalous, but it doesn't mean that you see anomaly in transport. Do we agree that this is what we are discussing? So essentially, what you see in the imaginary part of the self energy doesn't automatically translate in transport because. Uh, you may, you may have to bear a invariant, for example. This is what UNCLAP is. Okay, these are all that the discussion is going on. Okay, so ju just so, no, because there was, I mean, we are making this discussion since one week already. I've been in over everybody was here. So, so the point probably has to be stated in this way. Okay, but okay, just to, to make it. So and the question would be that. I just way. want to add that uh, no matter. I have to keep. Sorry. Okay. No, no matter how. Because there are other people. So, no matter what the self energy we find. Okay. Okay. Answer is clear. Okay. Can I just interact? Yeah. Umclap by itself is not enough. You need multiple umclap. Just one umclap, you can gauge it away. Can I address this very quickly? In this respect, Marka, when you were saying several times vertex corrections are irrelevant in your case because self energy is only frequency dependent. Yes, self-energy is frequency dependent. However, wavy line, bosonic propagator, is momentum dependent, and it's important for you. Then if you calculate Mikey Thompson diagram, it's not zero because of this. So in this thing, uh, yeah. For the current, yes. Uh, I was mentioning that only for the uh, conductivity, for the current, current response, yes. then it for is zero. Yes, no, no, because of momentum dependent, it's not zero. Uh, yeah, Mark, you mentioned the choice we made. So I'm under the impression that the choice we make was like the choice you make in a steakhouse. You take the steak. So what, according to you, is the fish? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what is the other? What is the other option? I, I think that you can only uh, say that if you if you see the, the coherent spectral weight. Uh, and it depends on temperature, is to say, well, I, I, I have no other way than saying, okay, so apparently the mass depends on temperature. But you seem to have another way of, uh, um, of, of translating that, and I wanted to understand how. Uh, yes, what I'm saying is that um, uh, our self-energy looks very much uh, like the marginal Fermi liquid self-energy, okay? So no wonder that if I calculate the optical mass M star, I get exactly the optical mass you, you find, okay? But uh, this, so I get a logarithmic divergent optical mass. The slope of this mass instead was fixed by fixing the total uh, spectral weight using a tie binding model and calculating the kinetic energy of this tie binding model. Do I remember correctly? Oh, and this fixed scale, somewhat the, the slope, the slope of, the, of this logarithmic term, okay? The other term, which is the other M star uh, data, was the specific heat 
data. And what I'm saying is that these do not come from fermionic quasi-particle with a marginal Fermi liquid like or a shrinking Fermi liquid like self energy. They come from purely bosonic degrees of freedom. So there would be no reason why the slope is the same. But then I say, don't care about that, because if I adjust in a different way the slope of the optical mass, no, so then I'm fine. Is quite different. This okay, is what I'm saying. Uh, the experiments that you uh, uh, refer to uh, indicate a relatively small energy scale. And I guess my question is, how, how do you connect to the larger energy scales in the problem, the pseudogap and the pairing scales? Sort of the Wh which scale? How do, you, how do you connect in your thinking to the larger ener energy scales of the problem? The, the experimental data, the RICS data you mentioned, uh, extract a relatively small scale. You're focusing on, on, on quantum mm -hmm. criticality at, at, at low energy scales. But in your thinking, how, how do you connect to the larger energy scales in the problem, the pseudogap phenomenon and, and the uh, this, pairing? Uh, this, I must say, I think has a different origin. So um, they can be magnetic. They can also have some origin from the charge density waves. So those with a longer, because since this charge density fluctuation have an intrinsic uh, weak uh, momentum dependence, I don't think they are able to produce pseudo gaps, for instance. So, and this is why probably they pass uh, and they cover uh, of the whole phase diagram, uh, both above and below the pseudo gap line, for instance. So I think this pseudo gap comes from more momentum dependent uh, fluctuation, which can be spin fluctuations, or also cooperatively perhaps charge density wave fluctuations, but in any case they have nothing to do with this charge density fluctuations. Yes, uh, what, what has to happen in order to fulfill point two on your list? Uh, you mean this? Uh, Physically. Oh, simply the fact that this is why I was mentioning this. Uh, uh, okay, uh, simply the fact that uh, this physics here, the strange metal physics, doesn't come too close to the quantum critical point. Because if I stay here, the correlation length is still finite. So the idea is to why the strange metal occurs near quantum critical points is simply because I need quantum critical points to have abundant fluctuations, to have them uh, at reasonably low energy, okay, 10 mV, say, but you, if you go too close to them, all the fluctuation becomes very peaked in momentum, and then the luminar rise argument uh, applies, and you lose the linear resistivity because you have only odd stops. So there is some intermediate range everywhere in this region here, close but not too much to the quantum critical point in order to have some finite, rather short correlation length in order to have done some uh, generically uh, isotropic scattering. And of course, if I go too close, then I start losing the strange metal behavior because the fluctuation here become too peaked and then I start seeing upwards curvatures in the resistivity. So because I don't know if I answered your, your question. So this is why. Uh, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is the mic somewhere here? Yeah. Okay. Thanks to all speakers. And uh, we reconvene at 11.10.